Hello everyone, and welcome to the American Civil War Museum's Homefront Education Series. My name is Joseph, and today we'll be bringing some of the stories of the museum straight to you in your homes. Uh, this one is a little bit different though. We're gonna be doing one of our classroom programs, uh, specifically about the medical practices during the Civil War. And to do so, I'm joined today by my colleague, Kelly Hancock. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Great. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about the medical practices here. Um, I know this is especially important right now, but during the Civil War, over, well, 600,000 people died, and most of it was not due to battlefield injuries. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, of the 600,000 or more who died, and the, the numbers have kind of shifted to where some historians think there may, be, may have been as many as 750,000 soldiers who died. But of those, uh, at least for every one man who was killed by a bullet, two more died as a result of disease. So disease was the most deadly foe of the war. Wow, so disease is really what's, giving, what's causing people to die during the war more than anything else. Uh, well, what are some of the causes of this? Well, for one thing, uh, they didn't have any germ theory at the time. Although they had microscopes, they could see bacteria and viruses, they didn't understand the role that they played. So without knowing what caused disease, it was very difficult to fight against disease. And they didn't know the importance of washing your hands or sanitizing uh, surgical equipment or uh, of social distancing. Oh, wow, yeah, I'm sure they're not living exactly uh, far apart from each other in these camps that, uh, on the battlefields or outside the battlefields. Exactly, so you've got armies of 100,000 men at, at times uh, packed into very close quarters. You may have a soldier who uh, comes into camp carrying a disease like the measles and uh, in that close environment would spread rather rapidly. They didn't have vaccines at the time except for one, that was the vaccine for smallpox. But, uh, so, and a lot of the men came from small farms. They came from very isolated areas. They hadn't been exposed to many of those childhood diseases. So especially during the first two years of the war, you see uh, epidemics taking place among the troops. Wow, and so basically what you're saying is that as they're coming in, as the people are enlisting, they're not even asking them if they've had those kinds of diseases before? Exactly, the physical was very basic. And as long as a soldier had both of his legs and feet and hands and arms and could march and tote a rifle, he was pretty much good to go. Now he didn't need teeth. A uh, soldier had to have at least 75% of his teeth and that was for tearing those cartridges but they weren't really looking at whether these men were physically fit to serve or finding anything out about their past medical history. And so just like you said, if someone does come in to camp with the measles, they're pretty much gonna spread it to everyone. Wow. And you mentioned something about sanitation and hygiene, but what are they also eating at the time? The mainstay of the soldier's diet was this. Oh, is that hardtack? That's hardtack. So hard, in fact, it was known as a teeth duller. This is basically a big cracker, flour, salt, and water, but not a lot of nutrients in this. They did get rations of peas, or beans, rice to go along with that. And soldiers were supposed to have meat rations. Mm. But even in the U.S. Army, which was much better equipped than the Confederate Army, when the Army was on the move, uh, there were difficulties supplying the troops with those uh, with the meat rations. So they really don't have any fruits or vegetables to pull from either? No, other than what they could scavenge along the way. So they're not eating a healthy, balanced diet. They're not getting the nutrients that their body needs to fight off disease. Right, so they're no, they don't have the immune system built up so that they can even fight off disease, but then after the fact, just the sanitation, the hygiene that you're mentioning, they're not even taking steps to prevent it from coming in in the first place. Exactly. Uh, this is a bar of soap like soldiers had, and there were regulations that said a soldier was supposed to bathe once a week. Okay. Uh, many of these men uh, went weeks or months without bathing, especially in the winter time. And you had problems with uh, the way the latrines were dug, the trenches that they used as toilets were sometimes dug, uh, upstream, too close to a stream. Mm. So you have uh, soldiers uh, 
using the latrines and then human waste overflowing into the stream, into the source of drinking water. And soldiers are going and filling up their canteens and then drinking from that contaminated water. Wow. You also have thousands of horses and mules that travel with an army, leaving behind their bodily waste. Wow, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, there are thousands of mules that are involved with that too. So that's really interesting. And so basically, what are the top three uh, that are really causing these kinds of diseases and problems? Well, the leading cause of death was diarrhea or dysentery. And the surgeons at the time kind of used the terms interchangeably, so we, we tend to kind of lump them together. That was the leading cause of death, followed by typhoid fever, which soldiers got from drinking water contaminated mm. with human or animal waste, and then pneumonia. And of course, today, uh, pneumonia we, we still uh, deal with, but we, we have uh, antibiotics and even some vaccinations for uh, pneumonia. Uh, of course, everybody's probably had diarrhea at one point or another, but uh, it doesn't tend to be chronic or acute in most cases because we know about the bacteria that cause it and we can fight against them. Oh, that's great. I'm glad to know that we don't really have to worry about that uh, these days at least. Um, so. There are those inventions, those innovations that people are having to deal with, people are really getting sick, but of course there are battlefield injuries as well. Right? Uh, so tell me a little bit more about the battlefield injuries. Well, of the, uh, the battlefield injuries that were treated, 75% uh, of them were to the extremities, so to the mm -hmm. arms or to the legs. Those are the wounds that they knew how to treat. And 76% of the wounds were caused by this conical shaped bullet, the mini ball. And what happened with the mini ball is when it struck bone, it didn't simply fracture the bone, it shattered the bone. And we do have an x ray. They did not have x rays during the Civil War, I will tell you that. They came out well after it. But there was a guy who was out hunting with an old black powder rifle of doing it old style, somehow he accidentally shot himself. So we do uh, see this x-ray and you can see all the damage wow. that was done to that bone. And of course this would cause infection to set in. They knew that infection was deadly. Mm -hmm. They didn't, uh, without antibiotics, they didn't have a way to fight infection. So they had to head it off uh, before it really took hold. Wow, so what's the number one way that they're heading off this infection? amputation by cutting off those damaged arms and legs. And it's estimated that they did about 60,000 amputations during the course of the war, about 30,000 for each side. And so these are field surgeons that are doing that? Pretty these are field surgeons. Most of the amputations took place on the battlefield. And that was really ideal because uh, the, especially the, the Union Army was very uh, firm in believing that amputations should occur within the first 48 hours. Mm -hmm. These were primary amputations. And they knew the importance of uh, cutting off that, ins uh, that source of infection quickly. Uh, whereas uh, on the home front, uh, when uh, in the civilian world, people tended to think of amputation as a last resort. Mm -hmm. They tended to put it off. And uh, because of that, in the civilian world, the survival rate for amputation was only about 50%, whereas with the Army, you're looking at about 74% if you go by the U.S. Army records. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, but of course, they have to get people off of the field first. You're talking about how the mini ball is causing so much damage uh, to the extremities and to just the body in general. Uh, so if someone's getting shot on the field, they need to get pulled off the field. Right. Exactly, and that's uh, one thing that really kind of develops during the Civil War is this very organized system for evacuating the wounded. Huh. And uh, you have men who were trained to be, by the, about the second year of the war, you have men that were trained to be stretcher bearers, members of the ambulance corps, who would get the wounded off the battlefield to a forward aid station. And the forward aid station was set up uh, out of small arms range. So they tried to at least be uh, kind of out of rifle range in a protected area such as a gully or a dip in the land. That's where the forward aid station would be manned by assistant surgeons. So the wounded are initially brought there, 
the assistant surgeons triage the wounded. Mm -hmm. Triage comes from a French word, trier, which means to sort the wounded, and that's what they're doing. They're sorting the wounded and deciding who needs to be treated first. And if a soldier had a penetrating wound to the abdomen or to the chest, uh, those wounds were considered mortal. And uh, those were wounds that would not be treated uh, until all uh, other wounds were taken care of. They were basically, those soldiers were considered killed in action, even though they weren't yet dead. But what they are treating are the wounds to the extremities, to the arms and to the legs, because those are the wounds the surgeons knew they could fix. And what they're doing there at the forward aid station is stopping the bleeding so the patient doesn't bleed to death. Mm -hmm. And then those soldiers are transported back to the field hospital, which was about a mile away. Wow. So uh, at that field hospital, that's where they're going to start doing the amputations then? Exactly. Well, so I've been shot on the field, took a bullet to the arm, uh, and they pulled me off the field to stop the bleeding. Now they're sending me off to the field hospital, and this is where I get my arm cut off? Ex yeah. Are you ready? All right. Well, let's first wash our hands. <laughs> All right. So we are here. We've washed our hands. We are ready to do the amputation. Is that right? <laughs> That's right. And the surgeons at the time, remember, they didn't know about germs. So when they wash their hands, if they are washing them, they're not scrubbing up. Uh, so they might wash the surgical instruments, just rinse them off in a, a bucket of water, but they're not sterilizing the instruments, they're not wearing gloves or a mask, any of the things that we think of uh, as uh, kind of basic precautions that surgeons take today. Now one thing that they did have that many people aren't aware of is that they were using anesthesia on a regular basis. Oh. On the battlefield, they tended to use chloroform. Chloroform is a liquid, and they would administer it in a number of different ways. This is a fairly basic way to do it. The funnel with a sponge there, pour that liquid in, the patient then inhales that and is rendered insensitive to pain. They did have some more sophisticated inhalers, and they could do it as, as simply, too, as just putting the chloroform into a cloth and holding the cloth over the nose as well. Well, whatever is better than just having a bite stick and exactly. <laughs> for it that Yeah, way. bite the bullet. That uh, that was well before the Civil War, <laughs> so we're not going to make you bite the bullet. Well, thank you. Now, after Joseph is rendered insensitive to pain, the second assistant, and I should mention that there would be the uh, surgeon who was actually doing the amputation. He was the one with the most experience, and then three assistants. So one assistant administered the anesthesia. The second assistant was in charge of controlling the bleeding during surgery. And this is a brass screw tourniquet. You can tighten it or loosen it to control the flow of blood. So we're just going to put it here on Joseph's arm. I'll let you hold that if you want. You. All right. Some assistant surgeons preferred to use their fingers. They didn't like using that device, but whatever uh, worked. That way, he's not going to bleed to death. The third assistant was there to stabilize the limb, and once it was removed, to take it and throw it in the pile with all the others that had been removed thus far. Okay, so there's just a pile. There's just a pile. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, at, at some point, they would uh, bury those in a mass grave. So as a surgeon, I'm going to take this tool right here, my Catlin knife. The Catlin knife was sharp on both sides, or at least it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And this is used for cutting through the skin. So let's say that Joseph has been wounded right about here in his wrist. We would move up a bit via above that and then use this knife to cut through the skin, pull that skin back. Then we're going to take our scalpel and use this to cut through that next layer of flesh, the muscles and the tendons. Mm. And in making the second incision, we're going to move up a little bit further. And again, pull that back. Now that we're down to the bone, there were some surgeons that thought it was important to scrape the bone. So you could take your bone scraper, scrape the bone. <laughs> there were other surgeons who said, why am I going to do that? I'm just going to cut it off. So they skipped that step and went straight to the capital bone saw. And then, of course, with this saw, I would completely sever the limb. The third assistant takes that arm, throws it into the pile with all the others. Now, we're not done yet. We don't want Joseph to bleed to death. So I'm going to take this little device, a tenaculum, and use this to hook 
arteries and blood vessels. They're elastic, so they tend to retract and go back into the body. So what we have to do is hook, pull, and then tie off those arteries, the blood vessels, and that's called ligation. Arterial ligation is one thing that really advanced during the Civil War. At the beginning of the war, the surgeons knew very little about the role of arteries and blood vessels. But as the war went on, they learned more and more, and this uh, became more sophisticated uh, in how they did that. So now that we have the bleeding control, the last thing that we might want to do is when we cut that bone, there could be some shards of bone, some jagged pieces of bone. If you've ever sawed a board in two, you might uh, think about how that looked. And it's not always as smooth as you would want it to be. So we're going to take the gnawing forceps and use those to nip off any jagged pieces of bone. Then take our bone file and just smooth off the end of that bone. Now when I cut, I started with the skin, then I went to the muscle, then I went to the bone. So what we're going to do now is pull all that down. And so we end up with a flap. This is a flap amputation. We end up with a flap of skin that comes down over that bone. And it's kind of a protective covering for that bone. And uh, the idea was that it would uh, help uh, when the soldier wore a prosthetic device. So when Joseph gets his new artificial arm, it might fit a little more comfortably. I think we actually have a couple of those artificial arms in our collection. Too. We do, and we have a, a, a very nice one on display in the main gallery. Wow, excellent. So is that everything then? There? Well, we would um, maybe stitch it up. Some surgeons did, some didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, they've put some salve on it, maybe some lint. This is the forerunner of gauze. Mm. And then, of course, you might bandage up that stump and then just kind of revive Joseph here, fan him, get a little fresh air so that he comes to. Now, you might be in quite a bit of pain as you wake up from this surgery. Right. They did have painkillers. They had morphine, they had opium, and they had laudanum, which is opium mixed with alcohol. And today, uh, we are very aware that these are addictive drugs. They didn't realize that during this time, so there wasn't a set dosage. And uh, just as today, we have uh, in our country been dealing with an opioid epidemic uh, right after the Civil War. They had an opium epidemic. There were soldiers that did become addicted to these painkillers. Oh. So some things have changed and some things haven't. Well, that's excellent though. This is really great. Thank you. I'm feeling much better now that my arm has been removed. Um, I think that we're ready to, to head on out. Um, Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that you wanted to share with us before you go? Uh, anything that you think is the most important thing to come take away with about medicine during the Civil War? I think probably the most important thing that I want people to come away with is that there were advancements made during the Civil War and that amputation was a life-saving surgery. Mm. So this was a way of saving lives. This was not done because surgeons were butchers and bloodthirsty and didn't care. They knew it saved lives, and it actually did save lives. Well, thank you again. This has been wonderful. The Civil War was a time of great upheaval, and people had to adapt to an ever-changing situation. And this was no different in the medical field especially as people are getting wounded on the battlefield and need to find out how to get them off. And just as Kelly told us, also hospitals are expanding into specialty care. A lot of different changes come out of the Civil War, especially in it, when it comes to medicine. In fact, the United States' very first contribution to worldwide medicine came as a result of the Civil War. A book was written about all of the techniques and tactics used during the in the medical field during that time. And so, the medical and surgical practices of the War of the Rebellion became the very first worldwide contribution from the United States to global medicine. So next time that you're at your doctor's, think about it. Think about the techniques that they're using today that might stretch back to the Civil War or even earlier. So we'll let you think about that. And until next time, be healthy and remember to wash your hands.